When you say, um, you know, diversify your portfolio, everyone agrees there's a lot of economic science behind it. Of course, diversification is good, it's powerful. What diversification does, if it's done correctly, it should increase your total return without increasing your risk. Meaning anybody can get a high return at a high risk. I can, you can say, Jim, I want you to manage my money. I go to a casino, bet it all on red. If I win, I come back and say, hey, Shane, look how much I made. But of course, if it comes up black, you lose everything. So that's a high risk, high reward. And uh, in, the, in the long run, not winning that proposition. But the question is, can you increase the return without increasing risk? Or can you increase the return more than the amount of risk. That's what diversification does for you. But here's the problem. Most people don't really understand diversification. I run into people all the time. They go, I'm highly diversified. I've got 50 different stocks in 10 different sectors, technology, uh, consumer non-durables, uh, services, mining, etc. cetera. I'm, I'm highly diversified. And I say, no, you're not. You may have 50 stocks, but you have one asset class, which is stocks. And they become highly correlated in certain conditions. So yeah, you may have a lot of different stocks, fine. But if the stock market's going down, they all tend to go down together. If it's going up, they all tend to go up together. You're not really diversified if you're in a single asset class. Real diversification means having numerous asset classes that are not highly correlated to each other. So have a slice of stocks, absolutely, by all means. Have some government bonds, I like, you know, for uh, in the, the American, uh, investor, a lot of global investors, in fact, did, you know, 10 year treasury notes, you know, Australian government bonds for the Australian investor, et cetera, have some land, have some real estate, have some you know, venture, have some so-called alternative assets, hedge funds, if you can get in, they can be hard to get into, et cetera. And, you know, natural resources, oil, energy, water, and then uh, some gold and some silver. So that's real diversification because you know, gold will not correlate to stocks. Yeah, sometimes it does, but, but often they move in opposite directions. Gold correlates to bonds a little bit, but then you've got to throw in inflation, which helps gold and does not help bonds uh, and so forth. And so, by the way, I forgot to mention a significant slug of cash, um, maybe as much as 30%. And I actually call it the barbell uh, portfolio. So, you know, barbell, you have two heavy ends and a, and a connector, you know, so over here are your deflation hedges and your deflation hedges would be the bonds uh, the utilities you know and then you have your inflation hedges and, and they might be the normal stock portfolio gold etc but cash is in the middle cash is the thing that connects the two and cash has a couple of interesting properties but people say why would you have cash it has no yield well it has a very low yield there's no question about that but in a deflationary environment you can't rule out deflation and deflation cash can be your best performing asset because the nominal value is pretty much unchanged, but the real value goes up because every dollar is worth more in a, in a deflationary world. The other thing that cash does is the exact opposite of leverage. A lot of the assets I mentioned, I include stocks, you know, stocks, bonds, and hedge funds and others, and gold for that matter, they're volatile, they have some volatility. Cash has zero volatility, it's just cash. And so what it does is it reduces the volatility of the overall portfolio. So you can have volatile assets on either end of the barbell, but cash kind of damps that down a little bit. It helps you sleep at night. And then the third thing it does, and this is not very well appreciated, cash gives you optionality. It has embedded optionality. So we live in an uncertain world, that's kind of obvious. But how long, how deep is the uncertainty? How long will the uncertainty go on? We, we don't really know. So what that means is if you place your bets and say, okay, I really want to get into bonds. And I, I think there's a place for bonds. You get into bonds and all of a sudden here comes the inflation. Those, bo those bonds are going to do very poorly. If you get into stocks and here comes a recession, the stocks are going to do poorly. So these bets can be good bets, but they can also, it can also be a mistake. Or you get into um, a private equity fund, can do very well, some have, but it's completely illiquid. Don't expect to get your money back early from Henry Kravis. He won't give it to you as you're locked up for seven years. So the point is, the purpose of cash is, as we get more clarity, as some of these things, you know, Fed policy, central bank policy, inflation, deflation, as we get more clarity on these things, the person with cash has the optionality. You can pivot. If all of a sudden inflation comes in way higher than expected, you can go buy some gold. But if deflation appears, you can buy some bonds. So think of cash as uh, it's kind of an at the money call option on every asset class in the world. That sounds like a pretty valuable option. Well, that's what cash gives you. So a, a big slug of cash in the middle, maybe as much as 30%, just 
so that you can reduce volatility and be nimble. But real diversification is going to be stocks, bonds, alternatives, venture, hedge, natural resources, cash, gold. They're all going to be in the portfolio. And that will perform well in every state of the world. You know, some will do better than others, but that's the point. That's what diversification gives you. Now, I've said for years, I've always pointed to Russia and China. Russia has uh, almost quadrupled their gold reserves in the last 12 years, from about 600 tons to about 2,400 tons. China, the same, um, about 600 tons to about just under 2,000 tons that they report but they're non-transparent. They have a lot more gold than that uh, stashed in uh, something called SAFE, the State Administration on Foreign Exchange, which is a secretive Chinese stock and wealth fund run by an ex-PIMCO guy, by the way. He knows what he's doing. Uh, People's Bank of China is kind of transparent. SAFE is non-transparent. So every uh, six, seven years, what you'll see is the People's Bank of China will announce Oh, we've increased our gold reserves by 400 tons or 500 tons or whatever as the case may be. And well, it's not like they went out the night before and bought 600 tons. You know, good luck trying that, you can't do it. Well, what it means is that that SAFE took some of the, the hidden gold that they had been acquiring slowly and moved in an accounting entry, moved it over to the People's Bank of China and boom, there's 500 tons overnight. But of course they had it all along and they still do. So they probably have more. So Russia and China are big acquirers, again, triple and quadruple in their gold reserves. But now we're seeing it in a lot of other countries, the Philippines, Vietnam, Mexico, Iran is a major buyer, but non, non-transparent. Turkey has drastically increased its gold reserves. These are, these are major countries. So I look at that and there's, there's very good data from the IMF and the World Gold Council, so you can find this information. But the one that was just like not doing anything was Japan. They had about 600 tons. It tells you is two things. Number one, Japan had the gold all along. They had it in some sidecar or side account or Ministry of Finance hidden account, what as the case may be. And they chose to move it over to their reserve position, which they can do. That's an accounting entry. But they had to have they had to have had the gold all along. You can't buy that much that fast. So then that begs the question: Well, why all of a sudden? When you know China's making noises about invading Taiwan, well, if you're going to invade Taiwan, why not invade Japan while you're at it? It's just another chain of islands, as far as the Chinese are concerned. And this happened right around the time, maybe shortly after the um, U.S. debacle in Afghanistan which was, you know, the worst foreign policy, uh, military disgrace, humiliation in U.S. history that I can remember. I don't know how far you'd have to go back to find a worse turn of, turn of events. But all of a sudden, allies all over the world, you know, Israel, um, Japan, Taiwan, they're questioning the United States. Like, hey, we're, we, we thought you're under, we're under your nuclear umbrella. You stand by us too thick or thin. Here you leave Americans behind enemy lines. That's Japan sees the threat to Taiwan, feels they may be in the sights of the Chinese, feels the United States may not be as reliable as one had thought, and they'll have to step up a little bit financially, militarily, et cetera, and they're doing that. But that aside, that's a little geopolitical speculation, but that aside, the gold is real. Put it on the books. So the biggest buyers of the gold in the world are the central banks. By the way, from 1970 to 2010, Central banks were net sellers. Now, some bought and some sold, but on, on net, they were net sellers. We had Brown's Bottom in 1999 when the UK sold half their gold at the lowest price in uh, about 60 years. Since 2010, central banks in the aggregate have been net buyers. And so what does that tell you? It tells you that the most knowledgeable players in the world are adding gold to their reserves because they consider that a prudent hedge to the US dollar. If you have US dollar inflation, or to a collapse of confidence in uh, central bank currencies generally, or they're just saying, hey, we're, we're, we're part of the club. Uh, by the way, here's a good uh, trivia question. What percentage of U.S. reserves are in gold? The, the answer in China is about 2%. Uh, Russia is about 20%. You know what the percentage is for the United States? 75%. U.S. does not rely on euros and Aussie dollars and Canadian dollars for its reserve position. A little bit. So don't let any central banker, don't let uh, Jay Powell or Johnny Allen or any of these others tell you that gold's not a monetary asset. We have the largest gold stash in the world, and 75% of our reserves are in gold. So that's the U.S., uh, you know, as, as they say, uh, watch what they do, not what they say. <laughs>